You're listening to The Audit, presented by IT Audit Labs. This presentation by Bill Harris looks at the current state of storage technology and where it's likely to be in 2026 and beyond. We will take a look at advancements in legacy storage mediums like hard disk drives, flash drives, and magnetic tape and explore new mediums including 5D, DNA, and molecular memory. Join me, and Nick, and Bill Harris as we take a look at this fascinating tech that will surely impact us all. All right, hey Bill, how you doing? Doing well, how are you? Good, so we're back today and we're talking about storage today, the future of storage. And Bill, you had taken us on a journey here. We went we went pretty deep last time when we talked about quantum. And before that, we talked about the future of classical compute and how that was uh, the, I guess, the lithographies. Is it lithographies? Or That's right. Lithogra- it's lithographies. Mm-hmm. How those are getting much smaller. And then we went on a deep dive into quantum. And, and Nick, um, <laughs> I, you know, I feel dumber after that one. I hope I can leave today not feeling <laughs> quite as dumb as I did the past two weeks. Put it there. It'll be fun. <laughs> this will, today's going to be fun. Today's going to be fun? I think so. There's a lot of interesting things happening. And we won't get as quite as deep into the physics as we did with quantum. And are you going to reveal anything else about yourself? I think the first week, whiskey drinker and bromy, <laughs> is that what it's called? Oh, that's what, what you, that's what you say. Absolutely. Sure, why not? <laughs> Are you denying the whiskey part or the bromie part? Yeah, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have to have more whiskey to get through the brony part. <laughs> oh, it's brony. I, I messed that up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what else do we get, Nick? I think that was a good, that was a good overview. But the brony, I think that one sticks the best. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, the cats too. I think we discussed cats, but I'm the only one with a million cats. What are you gonna? And Nick, you're having a baby soon, right? So how's that gonna come and play with the cats? I don't know. I think we're going to have to get rid of some of these cats. We got too many. So, yes, baby is close on the way. Any tips, Bill? Any tips to get rid of cats? No, get for the baby. (laughs) Open the door. Um, (laughs) No, I don't know about the the baby. Yeah, good luck, man. It's going to be quite a journey. Yeah. The cats, I like it. Open the door. First one. Yep. Nice. So much fun. It is fun. We're looking forward to it, but it's going to be a big change. Okay. Well, awesome. All right. Well, let's get into it then. Bill, we'll turn it over to you to, uh, to take it away here. All right. Hello, this is Bill Harris with IT Audit Labs, and today I'll be talking about the future of data storage. So here's our agenda for today. We're going to start kind of you know broad and, and really start to get into some details as we, as we move from current day into, into the future. So I'm going to go over the data landscape as it exists today, and I'm going to talk about what the industry response is to that how the industry is is compiling solutions to uh, address today's challenges. Among that will be magnetic tape, magnetic hard drives, flash storage, holographics, and we're going to go all the way into DNA and molecular, and then talk about really what it all means uh, and when we might expect to see some of those technologies become available. That magnetic tape, Bill, and, and I've had to do a few restores um, mm-hmm. reliant on tape, and I can't say I've ever had a good tape experience okay well that's part of the that's 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 part of the uh part of the problem but we'll talk about some of the upsides of that as well so and then um, we got built a mile well we did so <laughs> <laughs> so um let's talk about the data landscape as it ex- as it exists today so uh in today's terms there's a little bit over about 100 zettabytes of data uh, so just a tremendous amount of data in the world today, and that's going to be doubling probably by 2025. Um, data centers themselves are responsible for about 2.5% of carbon emissions. So these things, these big spinning hard drives and uh, these racks and racks of computer equipment is getting a lot of attention as we seek to become more environmentally aware. So as I referenced earlier, by 2025, we expect the amount of data that we generate each day to reach about 463 exabytes. Now that is um, about almost about half of a zettabyte. So it's just growing by these huge amounts. Now, Bill, you use the term 
zettabyte and mm-hmm. kind of like on the quantum conversation where there was different was it quantum where they were t- or, or i think the different names of the quantum computers were kind of getting a little bit out there the names of these of the size of the the byte right yeah. when you get beyond megabyte and then when you get into gigabyte and then terabyte petabyte it you're using terms like zettabyte is that beyond yeah the terabyte so it goes from terabyte to petabyte to exabyte then to zettabyte and then after zettabyte comes a yottabyte which is the most fun name of them all because it sounds funny is that the one that the that was based on star wars with the yoda it's like yoda byte I don't know. It seems it seems like the yacht, it seems like that that's that prefix would have existed before Star Wars, but something to look into for sure. Nick, there's going to be a quiz on this later. I'm actively taking notes and looking up Zettabyte. That's good. Let me know, please. So, <laughs> so let's put this into perspective. Now that we know kind of where Zettabyte falls in the taxonomy of bytes, um, if we if you were to to picture this, we're talking about. 485 million hard drives every day. If a hard drive is a 1.2 terabyte drive, and most people can envision that, if you've seen a hard drive inside your computer, just imagine that many hard drives. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about um, 463 uh, exabytes. And Bill, that's what you're saying is generated every day? By 2025. That's what we expect. By 2025. What is generating that day? Like, what's the content? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so, I mean, it's everyone's cat photos on Facebook, right? It's, um, it's uh, you know, all the Reddits that you have out there. Um, it's, uh, you know, all the, it's, it's movies, right? So it's not only the movies that are hosted by the studios, but it's all the files that you might find on peer-to-peer networks, and it's all sitting out there. Um, it's health information. It's um, uh, just everything, right? And so that kind of gives you a feel for just all that data that we're referencing. And a lot of it's duplicative. Like a ton of this is, is just redundant data. It's not necessarily sure. unique. So this uh, is an enormous cost, right? We're talking approximately $5 trillion per year to continue to, um, to grow at this data rate. So you can see where we're going with this conversation today, uh, where some of the challenges are, um, which is uh, we have to... Uh, reduce this data footprint, first of all, right? So Do we, we can't build who is actually storing. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, Do sure. we know who's actually storing all this? Like who's the biggest players yeah. at Amazon, Google, who's doing a majority of it? Yeah. So yes, you're gonna have you're gonna have Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Oracle, like the big clouds for sure. Right. You're gonna have governments, right? So the United States government is a monstrous uh, uh, store of data. Um, private sector as well, big healthcare companies, um, financial firms, et cetera. Uh, the residential space is, you know, adds up to a lot. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So all of these companies are looking for ways to fit that same amount of data onto less and less infrastructure. Right, because they don't really want to give up their data. Right, for them, their data means money. It means information. For the military, data means uh, having a leg up on your worldwide adversaries. Um, in the business space, having all that data um, means being able to provide additional value that your competitors can't provide. Right, so um, so they don't want to give all give all that up. So we're seeing some really interesting technologies come out to compress that data, and a lot of these new technologies use things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to identify just duplicate blocks but blocks that are kind of close to being similar and then they apply these algorithms to compress that and then decompress it when it's needed. Um, So you'll see a lot of these early innovations at places like Microsoft and Facebook. Um, That's kind of and that's kind of typical as, as these companies grow, as we're seeing you know, Google, Microsoft, Facebook coming out with a lot of these technologies first. Now, as we go through this, you're going to see also how all these technologies have a keen eye towards density. Not only do you need to shrink the data footprint, but they want that storage medium itself to be as small as possible, because smaller means usually means cheaper. 
fewer materials, uh, it's going to draw less power and produce less heat. Over time, we will see the, um, the chipping away of mechanical data assets, you know, so those mechanical hard drives, um, robotic arms, you're going to see that kind of, that type of thing eventually start to go away as they introduce either solid state or molecular or biological mediums. So, Eric, let's talk, let's start right here. So you mentioned tape earlier. Hmm. Um, so tape is actually got a long life ahead of it, right? Oh. But here's, <laughs> here's where tape is used today highly effectively. It's used in the archive space. So what the, the image you're looking at here is a giant robotic tape library. For reference, these things often stand about six or seven feet tall, and they can be you know, as much as 15, 20 feet long. Or they can be a silo type of a type of an apparatus, uh, and these libraries, these these mechanical arms that you see over here, will just come out and they'll grab the tape, they'll put it into the drive, read the data off, put the tape back. Now this is effective if you never take that tape out of the library, because where the problems start is as soon as that tape comes out of the library and you got to send it off site, then you got to track it and bring it back. It's a mess. So keep it inside of that library, which is temperature controlled and humidity controlled, and you've got yourself a highly, highly dense storage medium that is enormously cheap. All of the seismology that runs today runs on tape. It stores data off of tape. So all these, like um, all the the uh, the trackers out there that are monitoring for earthquakes store all that data to tape today. Anything you put into Amazon, Deep Glacier, it's going to tape, right? So it's effective if you follow these basic tenets of store it and leave it. It's also, it doesn't do well if you're overwriting it a bunch of times, uh, as I recall. Tape does have an effective capacity, like an effective life to it. So if you have to overwrite it like hundreds of times, then yeah, you're gonna wear the tape out. But here again, if you're writing archival storage, you're not trying to overwrite that. You're writing data and you're going to keep it. Yeah. So I agree with what you're saying. When, when I was uh, early in my career, I was working for a startup company and we were running Exchange 2000, I believe at the time. And we were moving to a new building. So we're going into the new building, they're building out the office space and, and they were consolidating the, the data center in the office space. It was the equivalent of about three offices in size, the, the data center. And I walked in there and I had the responsibility of, of running IT, but that meant very little. They really didn't listen to anything I said, um, but I still had the title. Um, so I walk in and I see that we've got our servers in this quote unquote data center and they have um, some cloths draped over the racks and the workers were in there with drywall saws uh, it, like manipulating the environment. I, I think they were going to make it a little bigger. I don't really recall exactly what they're doing, but I was like, wow, absolutely can't have this. This dust is going to get everywhere. Drywall particles are very small, it's going to be a huge problem. So of course I bring this up to management and this was in like the, 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 the dot com boom where you know you could start up a company and not really know what you're doing but you could still run it. Well, well these jokers, I, I bring it up, hey we can't do this, um, they basically give me a blank look and they're doing it anyway. So long story short, um, fast forward a couple of months hard drives start failing and they started failing because obviously the the dust had gotten in there and created a whole bunch of problems most of the time they were set up in either raid 5 or raid 1 and we were able to to replace the drives as we could but then came that day where the exchange server went down it was in a raid 5 configuration and we lost more than one drive i think we lost two drives, maybe three, and I think there's maybe a total of seven in the, in, in the whole thing, including some of the, the hot spares. Long story short, um, we could not recover the exchange data 
from those drives. We'd sent them off to uh, a recovery facility to try to get what they could off of it. And we're trying to restore from tape in the meantime. But that tape restore did not go very well. As I mentioned, the company did not want to spend a lot of money on IT. So we were just going through like the same 30 tapes, throwing them in this um, fireproof box. And then somebody was carrying that thing home every week. I mean, the whole setup was a joke, but Mm -hmm. um, that's why I have these, uh, you know, (laughs) PSTD about tape. Uh, Probably wasn't the tape itself. It was the, the, the oversight and the management of the tape. And we should have been doing it a lot better than we were, but spending that IT dollar um, was not as important as spending the marketing dollar. And long story short, we lost a, a bunch of email, couldn't get it back. And um, that was that was the end of it. Yeah, that sounds um, that sounds pretty horrific. First of all, sorry, you had to go through that. But uh, I'm not too surprised given the way that you described how the tape was maintained and transported. So yeah, these mechanisms are really are sealed mechanisms, the tape lives inside, it doesn't come out. Um, and as a result of that, it's, you know, it's clean, it's extremely power efficient, because you're not activating it until you're pulling data. Um, it's really cheap, it's extraordinarily dense. Uh, that tape's about the size of a hard drive, and it stores uh, 580 terabytes. So wow. Um, so it is still a very effective um, platform for storing data that you don't need speedy access to. But let's talk about um, what's happening in the hard drive world. Um, so hard drives, these mechanical drives that we're all used to seeing, um, are, are, have been around for a long, long time, gone through a lot of iterations, and uh, the latest iterations are as follows. So the ones that they're largely selling now are called hammer drives for heat assisted magnetic recording. And this is just an, a mechanism where they heat up the platter before they put the bit or bits onto the platter. Um, to, and, and, and by doing this, they can shrink the area, they can um, improve the aerial density of the platters um, and store more data. Now, for those who aren't aware, in a hard drive, you've got yourself these five, four to five, sometimes more uh, platters that are about the size, almost a little bit smaller than the size of the drive itself. They're all stacked one on top of each other. And then between these platters, there's a little mechanical arm with a read and write head. And so the drive spins around anywhere from 7,200 RPM to as much as 15,000. And as a drive spins, that mechanical arm goes across that drive and reads all the data. So the smaller you like the smaller space you can put bits onto the platter, the more you can squeeze to that platter. If if you're improving that density and you're squeezing more bits onto the platter, that means that the um, the drive cannot can, it has to spin less for you to pick data up, right? So if you're streaming off a lot of data that's kind of lined up perfectly you can stream data off of that drive extremely quickly, sometimes outrunning uh, solid state disks. Kind of like, a, it's like almost like a record player, right? With with the needle on a record player mm-hmm. and just going around getting that, that data off of there. I, I remember back at that same company, not to digress uh, on them again, but uh, we had taken apart a couple of the drives and this was the the era of the early IBM DeskStar drives, if you recall those. Um, but when we we took one apart, we saw that the actual platter itself was made out of glass, and then they had sprayed some sort of a, a coating on top of the glass that I guess you know was the the magnetic piece that stored the data. And I think this is you know we're talking the drives were in the the low gigabyte sizes. This is kind of early two thousands. Yeah, that's right. So there's this magnetic coating that. Um, uh, that holds the magnetism of, of the bits being deposited to the platters. So then after the hammer drives comes the, heat, the heated dot magnetic recording, which is an iteration on the same concept. Um, doesn't require too much more explanation. Um, and then it, it kind of, because it's very similar to what I just talked about, it just gets, kind of gets that dot even smaller. And then uh, they're also working on the, the microwave magnetic recording, which um, deposits the dots to the, I call them dots, but it deposits the bits to the platters using microwave technology. Again, it's just another re- another uh, effort to reduce and, you know, and, 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 and make it as dense as possible. So would you say there's a heating element in the drive or mm-hmm. in some cases a microwave unit in the drive itself? Yes, like little, like a very tiny 
mechanism that either heats that you know that that platter up or or, or um, transmits that little a little tiny microwave to aid aid in recording. Yep. So while Nick's uh, heating up his veggie burger, he could do that in the data center <laughs> <laughs> and have lunch. <laughs> So, um, as a result of these technologies, we we do expect to see 30 terabyte drives by the end of this year. Now, right now, the biggest drive you can really buy is going to be, I think, about 22, 22 terabytes. Um, however, Seagate has released the 30 terabyte drives for uh, for early testing to select customers, uh, mostly in the cloud space, of course, because they tend to get them first. We should expect to see 100 terabyte drives by 2030 using these technologies. And what makes it so easy to adopt is because it is still a hard drive, just like any hard drive we use today. And so you plug same it into- Same form factor. Yeah, same form factor, same SATA interface, right? So it's, I mean, it's brilliant from that aspect. The There's no barrier to adoption. You just shove it in there and away you go. If they're getting smaller, right? The amount of data is, the amount of data that you're putting in a, a really so small space keeps shrinking how do they deal with that like from an error correcting standpoint like if there's a tiny bit of damage to the drive or a dust particle mm -hmm. that's going to disrupt lots and lots of data versus um, in the past where it might not have been as big of a deal yeah so a lot of the drives have error correcting circuitry and telemetry built into them so that if it detects any um, any issues with its medium, it will transport that data to a better area of the platter and then it'll cordon off that bad area so it doesn't write to it anymore. This is wild. Um, so really the challenge is here, this all sounds fantastic, but the challenge is, is, it is that you still have yourself a spinning hard drive. And so it is still slow, right? By today's standards, faster than a tape, usually but not always slower than solid state disk. So what they're doing, before I go to NAM, what they're doing is they're addressing this with dual actuators. Um, so on the dual actuator drives, they just all what, what all they do is they insert a second arm in there. Now you got two arms on the drive, um, reading and writing data to these four or five platters at the same time. And so that doubles your throughput, um, gets it up to about SSD speeds, but at the risk of introducing another mechanical device that can fail. I, I find it an interesting kind of way stop on the way to, to, to full solid state. And I'm not sure how much that dual actuator device will really be adopted, but it's innovative. So um, let's talk about NAND, because that's you know really kind of what's, NAND has supplanted so many hard drives today. NAND, first of all, this is when I say NAND, I'm talking about the, um, the little storage cells that make up flash drives, solid state disk, all kind of the same, the same thing. This has been around since the 80s. It's old technology. It's just been perfected over the last two decades. The, the way they're improving on this today is that they keep, they're going, they're going three-dimensional with these NAND layers, right? So each one of these little layers you see in this graphic are a bunch of these storage chips, which I keep calling NAND. Um, and they're usually produced, most of them are produced overseas and they're assembled, but now they're going up. So whereas before they would kind of go left and they would kind of go like left and right with it. So now they're building these up and stacking them. And that is why they call this uh, 3D NAND. So you may see that on a lot of hard drives today. It's just that they're, they're going up the chip. So this makes it really efficient from a space perspective, but it also kind of makes it pretty speedy because um, you can now use this third axis to retrieve data. NAND is, and solid state drives in NAND, they're power efficient um, because you're just kind of sipping electricity as opposed to running a motor and a hard drive. They don't produce a ton of heat. And uh, of course, it's a whole lot faster because it's just fetching the data completely electronically as opposed to mechanically. The downside with NAND is that it is still not especially dense. The biggest solid state drive you can find today that's built into that form factor, I think is 100 terabytes. Um, so what a lot of the players have done today in the enterprise space is they've departed from the hard drive and now they're building these separate solid state cards that fit into their, into their devices. Uh, and in doing that, they can reach higher levels of density uh, and, and, and start providing, you know, uh, multi-petabyte storage arrays. Would you say this is the stuff that you see on the USB storage drives? Yeah, USB storage drives use, 
use these NAND cells in them. Usually they're lower quality NAND cells, meaning that you can only write or rewrite to them so many times before they just give out. Um, but yeah, same technology. I was uh, talking with somebody the other day and they mentioned that now uh, Micro Center is giving away 64 uh, gig drives for free, right? I think you have to get the coupon on the paper or whatever it is. But oh, yeah. um, it used to be, you know, there it, it was like, you know, 64 megs and now they're up to 64 gigs already. Yeah. That's so all I was free. thinking about the, uh, what is it, the uh, floppy disks, the floppy oh, drives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember having to bring those to school in like elementary school to like, you know, give to your um, IT teacher, right? And that's how you would put little things to bring home on. And there's just small little amounts of data go on there. It's just crazy what we've got now in your pocket. Yeah, those little thumb drives are very cheap. They're very effective. Um, you might go to a vendor meeting and they'll, they're going to want to, they used to give you their marketing collateral on these thumb drives as you walk out the door, right? It's just... Um, just very cheap to produce, um, and, and when you're done with them, you can just throw them away. They give you that and a virus at the same time. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Let's put the malware. <laughs> now it's just all through email and, and websites. So Nick likes to do a thing where he drops the uh, yep. for a pen test, drops the <laughs> USB drives in the parking lot. It's amazing. Say, you put it, put a little the USB drive in the wall in the mason. You know, you cement around it. You have the little, little end sticking out, and you plug your computer right into the wall. See if somebody will do that. People do it. They'll do it. Yeah, that's crazy. It's a thing. Oh, uh, it's nuts. It's like it's like taking on. It's like it's like yeah. It's it's about as clean as like you know taking a a, a, a lollipop you find on the street and just popping it in your mouth. It's, it's like why would it's they do like that? running into a burning burning building. Yeah, you, you're <laughs> right. <laughs> There's no good way to come out of this. No. <laughs> Nick, do you think if we put a few of these USB drives around that, that are Bill's summer, summer pictures, we could get people to plug them in and take a look? Without a doubt. <laughs> Without a doubt. Summer pictures. <laughs> no, that's good. You're listening to The Audit, presented by IT Audit Labs. We are experts at assessing security risk and compliance while providing administrative and technical controls to improve our clients' data security. Our threat assessments find the soft spots before the bad guys do, identifying likelihood and impact, while our security control assessments rank the level of maturity relative to the size of your organization. So we're going to move on to some of the, some of the more futuristic stuff. Everything I just talked about is available today. Now, these next few items are going to be stuff that are in development. I'm going to kick it off with holographics because holographics is something that got started um, over 10 years ago, and it never quite really went anywhere. Um, and I'll talk about why that happened and what's coming next. So to introduce us to this concept, um, a holographic storage is the way it works is that it 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 takes um, uh, it records images to the same area of this medium, usually like a medium like a like a DVD type of of, of medium or something similar, using different angled light, uh, and they create a hologram out of it. So I think it's you know fairly easy to think about if you think about a hologram. It's like okay that makes sense. This was originally thought of back in the 60s. So it's nothing super new. It, it promised um, very highly parallel throughput because you could read that data back at multiple angles, just like you wrote it. And so you can parallelize the throughput and it's also very dense. So everyone in this industry that I've been looking at recently likes to measure things in terms of sugar cubes. This will probably come up to, again today in this presentation, but you can fit a terabyte into a sugar cube. Sure, that's, that's, that's pretty good, that's, that's pretty dense. Um, the challenges to this, though, and this is one of the reasons I think it didn't quite make it, is it's not rewritable. So you burn that hologram onto that medium, that's where it lives forever. Super durable, it's going to last thousands of years, but you can't go over and redo it. Well, it's good for archival storage. It is. It's good for archival. But I think the other reason it didn't make it is that it's, although it's, it's sort of dense-ish, it's not quite dense enough. Um, I think the optics that you would require to write to to that, it it just it just wasn't you know it, as I say the juice wasn't quite worth the squeeze. Um, so this is now on hiatus. The technology is there, but it's looking increasingly unlikely that this will really ever make it to mass market. So 
a child to holographic storage that holds a little bit more promise uh, that they're playing with right now is our, our 5D crystals. So this uses um, a, a very, very fast laser to etch into a specialized glass. The laser is, uh, is measured in, in, in a femtosecond. So a femtosecond is one quadrillionth of a second. It's uh, super, super quick. And so what it does is it, it stabs this little dot into, into this specialized glass, uh, and, it, and that dot then represents a, um, a, a bit of data that can be read back later. And it can do this all over this little platter. And this is what you're looking at here. These little lines are all little tiny dots. This was introduced at the, uh, closer to the turn of the, uh, of the century. And it is even denser than the holographic storage that we talked about, right? So you're looking at 500 terabytes on a 12 centimeter disk. So it's pretty dense and it lasts billions of years. So this is a fantastic solution for archival. But wow, is it slow. So reading all that information back, it's, it does take you back to the modem years. It can, it can send information back at you know, around 28,000 bits per second, which is uh, for today's information load is probably not sufficient. So either they're going to have to improve the throughput on this, or it'll probably just fall by the wayside. Why is it called 5D versus 3D? Um, I don't really know. I want to say probably because it sounds a lot cooler. Okay. But um, I'm not certain. So. Yeah, and I guess, Bill, too, with this, compared to, like, tape, is this more cost-effective? Is it much more expensive? Or So at the moment, terabyte for terabyte, it is much more expensive than tape yeah, um, kind of because of, yeah, and because, yeah, uh, the, the specialized material is required, right. um, which isn't to say that they can't make it cheaper than, than tape, right. um, you know, in time, but they're really going to have to pick up that, that transfer speed because that's, that's probably going to be a deal breaker. So um, this one holds more promise. Uh, I tell you, DNA storage has really been getting a lot of attention over the last decade or so. Um, a lot of companies have really invested in it. Microsoft is a huge investor in DNA storage. Um, they've got an R&D lab devoted to it. They're developing devices to make this, make this work better. Other companies too. Microsoft really stands out though. So DNA storage, is as the name implies, the ability to store information on synthetic DNA. Now, this is the same type of DNA that we think of, which uses, you know, for these four nucleotide bases. And so it puts this data on here in a very in a very dense fashion. So 215 petabytes, right, for one gram. So a penny weighs about two grams. So you could fit almost half an exabyte wow. onto the size of a penny. Um, absolutely huge. In fact, um, it is um, surmised that we could fit all of the world's information uh, in DNA within the size of a refrigerator. So it's wow, that's... stunning how much this thing can actually do. It lasts millions of years, right? So as if you any uh, you've seen. You've seen the shows, right? And so I can call out Jurassic Park, and sure, there's a lot of fiction there. But the, 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 the basic premise is sound that scientists have dug up DNA that has been thousands or millions of years old, and they've been able to, you know, to reconstruct some of it and read some of it back. Do you think the Russians and the Chinese are cloning dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. There's a smile and laugh. <laughs> we got him. Yeah, Got him. nice one. Um, yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be another. That'd be a whole other presentation if we're doing that. I'll come back for that one. Yeah, it's it's um, some of the other benefits of DNA is uh, as I mentioned on the slide, it's it's low power, right? Because once you put the data there, you're good. It's there. You don't have to do anything else to it. It just it just kind of stays as it is. Um, it is extremely expensive. So right now, to store a petabyte of to store and read back a petabyte of DNA is about a trillion dollars. Um, so not, not practical. But companies like Microsoft and others are building the apparatus to, um, to make that a whole lot more affordable. Part of the reason it's so expensive is because 
DNA is a biological, it's a, it's a wet process. You have to have lab technicians with pipettes and test tubes transferring you know, stuff from, from one container to another, and it hasn't, it hasn't really been um, uh, mechanized fully yet. Yeah, that so. seems crazy that it could be that expensive, but we could keep all the world's data in a refrigerator. Yes, that's right. That's crazy. Yep, yep. And that, well, that's just for one petabyte. So to put all the world's data into yep. a refrigerator, there isn't the money in the world to do that, right? Um, and the other bad part about DNA is that it is slow because of what I just mentioned. It's not mechanized yet. And so manipulating all that stuff, it just takes way too much time. Eric, to your question, let's talk a bit about how it works. So when you, the DNA, um, first you have to translate it to binary code, right? So you're gonna start up here. If you're trying to write information on a computer, you're gonna turn zeros and ones into AT, ATCGs. Now, DNA speak, I am not a geneticist, right? But um, you might recall from chemistry class, um, it's adenine, cytosine, uh, guanine and thymine. So those are the nucleotide bases that you have to work with. So you convert those zeros and ones into those letters A, T, C, G. And they got four things to work with. Then you take that to a DNA printer. They make these things. Um, and the DNA printer will then print out a synthetic strand of DNA into A, T, C, Gs. Um, then you take that synthetic strand of DNA and you store it. Again, you're talking about lab techs, right, with, with, with droppers and stuff. And so you have to store that into a, into a vial or a test tube, and then you can store that. When you're they using Jurassic Park, it was the shaving cream bottle, right, wasn't it? Yeah, they're using the shaving cream bottle. Yes. Yeah, probably the best place to store it, absolutely. Keep it yeah, safe from, from the wandering uh, T-Rex. And the Russian and Chinese. That's right, yeah. <laughs> So when you go to read it back, then you have to read it with a sequencer. Um, so you read out the sequences of ATCGs that are in that storage. You put that into the computer. The computer then converts those ATCGs back into zeros and ones. And now you got your data back. Yep, it was a Barbasol fan. <laughs> there you go. There you go, it's Barbasol. Nick doesn't use Barbasol though, no. as you can see. Well, I'm against it. Think of all the money you save. All natural. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, DNA is it's probably the one that's being worked on the hardest um, because it's going to be around forever, right? So long after we lose interest in maintaining the infrastructure for reading mechanical hard drives and tapes, um, we will have the infrastructure for, for reading DNA because we'll never stop sequencing DNA since we're made of the stuff. So in terms of not just data longevity, but in terms of technology longevity, it's got tremendous potential. There's a sibling to DNA. Um, RNA. No, but uh, that's a great, that's a, that's a good segue though. And uh, But no, this is molecular memory, right? So in so far, and so far as DNA stores data onto these nucleotide bases, which are molecules, molecular memory does the same thing, but it gets away from having, having to use those, those four bases. So now you can use different molecular structures to record that data, and you're not confined to doing it within DNA. The promises behind this one is you can get uh, those same densities. Um, however, the challenge is that in order to write to a molecule, you have to, you have to keep it still. And so to keep a molecule still, you have to make it extremely cold, which requires liquid helium because liquid nitrogen just won't even make it cold enough. Um, so that's when you got to bring in, you know, your, your heavy cryogenics and you got to cool this stuff down to, and you get into the whole problem that's facing quantum computing today, which is you're spending in a lot, you're spending a lot of energy to make something very cold so that you can then do something with it. But they are looking into this, um, right now, sort of a, a side of DNA. But I, I think as you can see, it presents different challenges. And my suspicion is that DNA might actually kind of uh, make it out first before before this one does. What is this one, uh, Bill? How does this one look for size? Is it similar to maybe you already said that? Is it similar no. to the DNA? 
Yeah, it is very similar DNA because you, the molecules that you choose to write to can be as small as you can write to. Got it. Yeah. So, Cost for this the same as well? What, probably not as bad because the biggest cost for this would be um, would be the cryogenics for the most part, sure. just cooling it down. But you, um, unlike DNA, you don't have to have all you don't have to have like a lot, like a, a bunch of text kind of. It's not. It doesn't have to be a wet technology. I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it can it. it can be it can just be a lot more practical. Is the DNA just sitting in like a, in liquid in a test tube, or how do they store it? Basically, they store it. So if you've seen on TV how they you know put those little pipettes into into those little dishes, that's basically how they're storing storing the DNA. Reading back from the DNA is so slow because you have to scan through all that material to find the information that you're looking for. So one of the things that they're doing to um, to to uh, develop DNA is come up with clever methods for um, for uh, searching through that sheer amount of data in in a, a lot more rapid fashion. So it's molecular. So, um, to, and that's about as far as out as we can really go, um, because that'll take us into probably the mid 2030s, you know, a dozen years in the future from now. Um, so to try to tie all this up, there are a, a few points to keep in mind. One is that the current technologies that we have today will be around for several more years. They've got a lot of life left in them. You're going to see tape. You're going to see drives. You're going to see those solid state disks. Um, they're not done perfecting that yet. And they are the bridge that will get us to the next level, which is, as we've discussed, um, you know, something like DNA or molecular. And that is going to result in this sudden jump, this big quantum leap in, in capabilities in terms of, especially in terms of, cap of capacities, maybe in terms of speed, if they can perfect that technology. But this, this can't come too soon because we do not have the technology today to really get us past 2030 with how we're writing information. If, if, we, if we try to persist, we're just gonna basically drain the world of silicon. It's like, we, we, can't, we can't mine the stuff fast enough. So we must move to something else. Otherwise we're gonna be in huge trouble. One way to keep an eye on this and keep an eye on um, how this is progressing is a, do your own research too and dig into this more, but also keep an eye on what's happening at the cloud providers. They're the ones with the monstrous data centers and they are the ones who stand to benefit the most from implementing these technologies um, as it will reduce their costs um, and also provide them an edge as they seek to court new customers. And Bill, do you have any stock tips on companies that are doing this uh, DNA storage? Um, aside from Microsoft, which would be one of them for sure, um, no, none of the smaller companies. I'm not sure any of the smaller companies were working on it. I was hoping for a good, you know, like dollar stock, Nick. You know, we get in early, um, and then off the wall. 2030, we're out. We're out. I, get, I keep thinking about this stuff too right now, Bill. It's so we're looking going back to the tape. Mm -hmm. So, like bigger, small organizations, they have this stuff or the tape technology for backup on site. Is there ever going to be a point where these technologies are also on site, or are they always going to be at a big data center like we saw the Fujifilm tapes, oh, yeah. right? A big data center. Do we do you ever foresee us getting to the point where this is readily available for an organization to have it on location? Uh, yeah, I do. I think it's going to be readily available for an organization. The question I have will be whether they will want it. Um, sure. because it, for, you know, for big companies, it might just be easier for them to say, you know what, we're just gonna, we're just gonna continue to transfer things over the wire to a hosting provider for other yeah, reasons. Right. Yeah. Interesting. As these storage mediums grow in capacity, meaning we're able to store more things in a smaller area, then doesn't that just allow us to create more data, you know, as I think of 4K video going to 8K video and then 16K video or whatever it is, we're just going to keep expanding on our use of data and essentially stay lockstep with the developments and storage. Yeah, it's a cyclical thing, and I kind of wonder which one drives which one drives which. Um, yeah, I mean, I think these 
advancements in capacity are in response to our growth in technology. And in some ways, you can say um, our growth in technology is due to advancements in capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. Well, thanks for taking us through this, Bill. You've been listening to The Audit, presented by IT Audit Labs. We are experts at assessing security risk and compliance while providing administrative and technical controls to improve our clients' data security. Our threat assessments find the soft spots before the bad guys do, identifying likelihood and impact while our security control assessments rank the level of maturity relative to the size of your organization.